Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shot episode 190, featuring a retrospective of Divine Divinity, the original Divinity game and the one that put Larian Studios on the map. Now, of course, they have uh, successfully funded their Kickstarter project for a new Divinity game, Divinity Original Sin, even hit some of their stretch goals, so it's a really exciting time and it shows the passion that people have for this game. So I thought it was a good idea to go back and look at the original game and, and see what all the fuss was about and catch up on a game that many of us have missed uh, back in the day. Anyway, a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Divine Divinity. And here we go with a game called Divine Divinity. This came out in 2002 out of Belgium by a company called Larian Studios. It's not, not nearly as well known, of course, as uh, Diablo, but it's in that vein, it's in that style of game, and the people who did play it uh, enjoyed it quite a bit. It got very good reviews at the time. It's uh, generally considered the best of the Divinity series so far. Uh, here's a little forward in the instruction manual authored by, of course, uh, Zvin Vinka, who I interviewed pretty uh, a couple episodes back in uh, on Matt Chat. So if you haven't seen that, you should go and take a look. Uh, but what's interesting about this manual, I thought, was or this uh, forward, is that uh, Zvin says that his uh, goal with this game was to create a game that's accessible for the majority of gamers, but at the same time, uh, maintaining the depth of a more traditional uh, computer role-playing game. So that's, of course, a worthy goal. And uh, we'll see if they succeeded in that. In the interview, it came out that this was originally supposed to be a turn-based uh, role-playing game, uh, but they were pressured by the publishers into making it an action RPG. So anyway, uh, let's get the game up there and uh, see what we can do with it. So as with Diablo, the first thing you need to do is select what kind of character you want. They're very uh, flexible, but they each have a distinct personality. I'm a bad boy. What you have to be to survive on the streets. To live in the gutter, a lad has to learn to cut corners. And on occasion, cut other people's purse strings. These days, the law only serves the rich. So I help myself. I am strong, as a man should be. The strength of my body and my skill with weapons are all I will need to defeat the many foes I will doubtless meet in my life. Evil must be cleansed with iron, gripped in a strong hand. A strong mind and a grasp of magic are all a man really needs to fight evil. I've seen an aged mage wither a mighty warrior with a simple word and a gesture. Such a mage will I be, using magic to remake the broken man. Yeah, let's check out the babes. Two ways of living for a poor girl on the streets. Prostitution or starvation. <laughs> I think we know which one you I chose. I took the third way. <laughs> I steal uh. from the rich and give it Why all to the my Why are the women almost self. naked? At least in this corrupt world, I'm a hero to myself. Well, Gosh. anyway. You don't really have to put a whole lot of thought into this selection because one of the good things about this game, in my opinion, is you do have a lot of flexibility you're not really stuck with a class, traditional class like the warrior. You can cast spells if you want to or get into some of the rogue skills. I guess it's more just a, an aesthetic choice. You know, what, what looks the best, what <laughs> voice do you like the best. Okay, then we get into the game. Now, it's very easy to control. You just, I'm just clicking the mouse around where I want him to go. You can hover over things to get a little uh, screen. You can also hold down the Alt key and it'll show you, it'll highlight anything that's important. They're just grabbing some treasure. A lot was made at the time about how great the lighting effects looked. Unfortunately, they seem to wreck, uh, wreak havoc with my Fraps recording software. So you'll notice um, every now and then if there's a lot of torches, <laughs> a frame rate will drop down to like two. It doesn't do that, though, when you're not recording. So if you just want to play the game, you should be fine. Uh, another thing that's cool about this game is you have a lot more things you can do with the items uh, than you could with Diablo. There's a lot of item combination, a lot of using things, a lot of adventure game style puzzles later on. So it's really, it's kind of a sort of a thinking man's version of Diablo, if, if you will. Lots and lots of detail, too. Uh, you notice all these books I'm pulling up, pages, a lot of uh, lore that goes with this. You could really immerse yourself. And I should mention the book... If you get this on GOG, I'll put the uh, link in the show notes. Uh, you also get a copy of the little novella that came with this. It's a little novel that sets up the uh, the background story. Uh, definitely, you want to read that if you 
want to get heavily invested in this. It's not going to be just pure hack and slash, I don't think. Uh, that's definitely part of the game's appeal, but there's a lot of uh, extra bells and whistles that might end up becoming more important to you than the actual hack and slash stuff. This amazing music, by the way, was composed by a Russian composer named Kirill Pak Pakrovsky. He's also doing the soundtrack in the new game as well. Ah, my friend, you're awake at last. How are you feeling? My name is Joram. I'm one of the healers here. There's a lot of good voice work in this game. Sometimes it's uh, quite humorous and funny. Not always sure that the actors are aware of the context. I tried to figure out who some of them were, but unfortunately uh, the manual doesn't credit any of them, and it's basically they, they outsourced it all to a, another company, so it's kind of a mystery to me who these uh, folks are. But if you do know uh, something about that, you know, please let me know. I think it'd be fun to get a list of credits out there, because these uh, guys are doing some pretty good work. Now, one of the things that uh, Sven talked about in the interview uh, concerning this game was, you know, the importance of really uh, paying attention to the dialogue and keeping in mind how the uh, non-player characters, the characters that you meet, think of you. Uh, they remember what you say to them, and uh, they watch certain things that you do. You kind of have a reputation with them, I guess. And it's, uh, you know, pretty easy to, to, to piss them off, and you might uh, miss out on some quests and things. Uh, I think you can still finish the game uh, regardless of that, but uh, you definitely don't want to just click uh, randomly on these dialogues. Uh, you'll get a lot more out of the game if you, if you pay attention. And the fact that we've lost contact with the source, well, our leader, Mardanius by name, seems to have gone, how should I put it, well, uh, he seems to have gone as crazy as a loon. Yeah. I just love the voice actors in this game. They, they really add adds to the charm of it, <laughs> even when they kind of are really uh, almost hamming it up a little bit, I think. And, you know, the one of the design goals of this game, of course, is uh, not to give you a really uh, constrained, linear, chained uh, experience. You're just going uh, from plot point to plot point according to the way the authors uh, might have planned. You know, instead, this is a kind of wide open you can play this character however you want. You don't know a lot about him anyway, as far as his family history, background, uh, anything of that sort. And so it's really kind of up to you to decide how you want to play this. I kind of see this in my mind as a sort of a combination of the Ultima 7 uh, Black Gate game uh, with Diablo, if you kind of follow what I mean there. Even the graphical style kind of looks like a blend of those two. We healers believe in sharing what we have with the needy. I see. As you are in my debt, I'll feel free to speak my mind. Learn better manners if you want to get anywhere in this world. You were very lucky that I found and healed you. Many would have simply slit your throat and robbed your corpse. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he likes me very much. Maybe I shouldn't have been such a dick. Okay, there we go. Uh, there's my quests. So basically what's happened here, we've got a crazy village leader and apparently possessed by some type of demon. So we can sort of start investigating that. There'll be a few little preliminary type quests to get you accustomed to it. Uh, this is the trading screen. Unlike a lot of games where you just have a designated store uh, where you can trade items. So you can try to trade with just about any character. They'll have different, different items, different amounts of cash. There's even some skills you can pick up that'll that you make better deals. Now, this is the inventory and the equipment screens here. You can see, that not a lot to start off with. Not <laughs> gonna be uh, kicking ass for a while. Which you know, something I like about a good, well-designed role-playing game is that they ease you into that badassery instead of just having you slaughter a dragon after five minutes of gameplay. All right, let's. Oh, there we go. There's that famous slowdown I was telling you about. Now let me just skip ahead forward a little bit. Mardanius, my poor old friend. What are you doing outside? Uh, oh, 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 it's you, Lanilor. I, I was... Oh, he will come. The end is upon us. Shelloy, you're raving, Mardanius. You must take more rest. Come, let me take you home. But Nemesis is near. 
We must be vigilant. We must be pure. We must uh, behave. Oh. What did you say, Lanino? Rest? Oh, yes, I could try to sleep. If only the voice in my head would be silent. I'm really glad that they got some decent voice actors for this because otherwise, you know, there's a lot of those scenes where these characters are just standing there talking to each other. There's not a lot going on, uh, visually speaking. can get boring, uh, but fortunately the talent is sufficient to keep those scenes at least mildly interesting. There's also a lot of humor and uh, jokes and such as that. So they, they, they had a lot of fun with this game. And you know, that, now that I've had a chance to talk to uh, Savin, I'm really starting to see his personality in this game in <laughs> various ways. Kind of amazing how that a little background knowledge of a, a game designer can affect the way that you play the game. And as you can see, there's quite a big area for me to explore well before I get into a, an actual dungeon. Kind of exploring this uh, town. It's, a, it's walled in and there's apparently some type of orcs, orc raiders outside the walls. I'm guessing I'm probably not strong enough to take those guys on yet. At least I, I would hope not. A little fog of uh, war. You can see my they got a mini-map in the top right corner instead of that weird sort of overlaid map that was in Diablo. I like this better. However, they did uh, obviously copy a lot of this from Diablo, like the standard colored bars down there. There's one for health, of course, one for mana, one for stamina, which is used up if you run around. Yes. One of the things you have to do really early in the game is figure out which of these towns people you can trust. One thing I'll definitely say in there, in the thing I like about this game is that there's not a lot of obvious villains and heroes. and you know, everybody, everybody seems to be occupying a somewhat gray area. But they've got motives. You can understand why they're doing the things they are. This is a hell of a basement. <laughs> You'd like to have a basement like this under your, under your house. I don't know who's in charge of keeping these torches lit. Searching the barrel is always a good idea, of course. Trying to get as many health potions and mana potions as you can get. Definitely be using those frequently. At least I was. I'm already getting some items. Let's see if it'll let me sleep. Yes. Now, sleeping will instantly heal you back up to full charge without having to use those potions, which uh, is a really good idea to try to save those for when you really need them. Just use the beds for resting. Ah, some more text. Well, let's go ahead and skip forward a bit here and see if we can see some actual combat. <laughs> so after solving one of the easiest puzzles in the history of adventure games, you get down here in this underground labyrinth dungeon complex underneath the town. Totally original <laughs> concept there, I know. Actually, this is a, a really huge game. There's several different zones you can get into. I, I forget how many hours of gameplay you can expect to enjoy here, but I think it's something like hundreds at least. It's a little bit tricky to find uh, getting around because you can't always see very well. It's so damn dark. But there are doors, and the, the pathfinding is decent, so if you can't figure out how to get into a room, sometimes you just click on it and just let the guy walk there. He's, he seems to know where he's going most of the time. Just seeing if I can do something if I snuff these candles out. Doesn't look like that's doing anything. Okay, let's try to find some monsters in this dungeon. Oh God, where's the skeleton when this you need one? This door is locked tighter than a dwarf's ale purse. Tighter than a dwarf's ale purse. Yeah. Hmm. I wonder what that did. <laughs> oh, it opened the door or it unlocked the door. That's a good idea, by the way. If you ever want to make sure people can't get through a door, make sure to have a giant lever on the wall that unlocks it. Okay, where are we? I can literally only <laughs> see like a few inches around my character. I wonder if there's probably some spells or maybe a item or something that will give me a little bit better visibility. Oh, there we go. Oh, <laughs> and he's down. <laughs> oh, there's another one. Oh, whack, whack, whack him. Whack him! Okay. What do we have over there? You know, this would probably be a little scarier if I didn't have that mini-map on, because uh, it actually will show me where the monsters are. Might be more fun if you just turn that off and let the darkness do its work. Now, if you 
left click on the enemies it'll use your standard attack if you hit the right button you can have a special attack you can select which one you want and uh, you can hit the one interesting feature is if you hold down the control key it will automatically target the closest enemy which is uh, actually that is actually just uh, really really nice <laughs> you pretty much have that control your finger perched over the control key at all times as soon as you figure out how to use that unfortunately I've mapped my special skill to repair which believe it or not trying to repair gear in the middle of a in the middle of a combat it's probably not the most effective thing I can have there okay let's take a look see if I actually need to repair anything looks like that sword needs some repairs those are my little skill trees over there I can select those unfortunately a skeletal archer <laughs> has decided to irritate me come on guys can't you see I'm trying to figure out this interface no oh. <laughs> just want to repair some gear oh god I can't fix this guy's problem nope okay whack him come on all right he's down there's my pots go ahead and pop one of those take a look at the quest log you'll notice there's not a guy with a question mark in sight <laughs> Sven made a lot of jokes about that apparently gonna slim down that quest log even more in the, the new game okay I'm kinda just wondering what the hell how the hell this skill is supposed to work I'm clicking it, but it doesn't seem to be repairing, so okay. Uh, maybe I can only repair it so much. Ah. <laughs> Screw it. Let's get out of here. So I think here's the other character I created, a, a wizard. I actually quite enjoy this character. I like his uh, the spells he has. Seems to be uh, quite powerful. Of course, you do run out of mana. It doesn't seem to automatically regenerate, so... That's a bit of a pain. Fortunately, for all, all classes, you have these transportation pyramid stone things. Uh, so it, it took me a while to wrap my head around the way these work, but you, you've got two of them, and you can carry them and drop them wherever you want, and then you can instantly teleport there from the other one. Uh, so, for example, when you're ready to, to leave here, if you want to come back here, you could drop the stone and then use it and that would teleport you back to wherever you left the, the other stone. And then when you got back here, you just had to remember to, to pick it up again, of course, and carry it with you. So it's not, you know, it's not obvious at first how it works, but once you get the hang of it, that's actually quite, quite an effective way to do it. You can definitely save a lot of time. One of the reviews I was reading about this game said that most of the time, 90% of the enemies that you'll find are basically no threat just trash easily dis easily dispatched but then that other 10% will kick your ass and they're just uh, around and you never know when you might run into one uh, so there's always a lot of uh, tension I would say I died many many times playing this and if you don't keep in mind that you should probably be saving it every few minutes uh, that that can get that can make you pissed off especially if you've just gotten a really great piece of gear or something like that and, just die around, walking around a corner. Uh, there's the different skills you can learn. And, you know, like I said, that you, you're, not, you're not stuck with that one tree. So even though I'm a sorcerer or a wizard, if I want to learn something from that rogue tree or the warrior tree, I'm fine. I can do that. No problem. So I actually think that's, uh, that's really great. Of course, just like in Diablo, uh, there are stat requirements for certain items. So maybe a sword requires a certain level of strength. So you can't really be, it might not be as effective, I should say, to try to be a jack of all trades. You know, if you want to do the, if you want to be a great spellcaster, you're going to need lots of intelligence. and You probably shouldn't let too many levels go by without buffing up your warrior's strength. It really sucks when you got a great weapon, but you don't have enough strength to wield it. One of the things I thought they did well, you know, better in some ways than uh, Diablo was they don't, just have you inundated with monsters, just constant battle after battle. Now this, the battles are spaced out more, so you have a lot more time to let, I guess, uh, anticipation build. And especially if it's been quite a while since you've seen a monster, you start to wonder, you know, is there a big, big pack of them about to, to besiege me, locked. an ambush around the next corner? Also gives you some time to actually enjoy the, the scenery. Look at these very detailed graphics here. 
Now again, I don't know if it was just me, but I did have a hard time finding the my way around this map. It's not necessarily clear where the doors are in <laughs> some of these rooms. I really wish they had had some way to indicate those on the map. You know something else too? There's not nearly as much loot. Interesting. A lot of people. That's the reason they like Diablo so much. Is just you know shit is just constantly dropping. Uh, here, only about maybe one out of every three or four monsters actually drop something, and when they did, it was just a little bit of gold. You know, barely worth uh, <laughs> taking the time to pick it up. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> He's going to flip out because there's a rat in the room. But it's just a little rat, you know. Sometimes you just got to let rats, let rats live, you know, and let them breed the population. If you just kill every rat you come across, you won't, won't be any left for future adventures, so. Okay, <laughs> somewhere in this dungeon is a skeleton. Come on. It's kind of crazy, you know, it's a lot of... A lot of time has gone by without me getting my sword wet. Oh, there we go, what is that, a skeletal warrior? Something on the wall here. I can't tell if that's something I'm supposed to interact with or... If it's just for decoration. It's pretty though. Okay, keep moving. And see these are quite easily defeated. There's another hallway. Obviously important. Kind of trying to slink forward here a little bit so I don't pull too many mobs at once. What do we have over there? Just some empty vases. Oh, warrior. <laughs> ah, the skeletons. Where would we be without skeletons? So I'm guessing from the, the map, this is one of the few unexplored areas, so it must be getting to the stairwell. Monsters are starting to come at me a little bit more frequently now. It's kind of neat how they can, you can see them just in the corner of the, the darkness there, but still target them with that control key. So ideally, I guess if you're if you're quick enough, you can kill the monsters well before they get to you, which is which is pretty cool. One thing I've been wondering about playing this, you know, going back to trying to imagine what what it would have been like to play this in 2002. You know, as I said, the game reviewers that looked at this were pretty much united in their praise of the game. And they definitely were, you know, Diablo 1 and 2 just created a huge fan base. Uh, for this style of game, and this is, you know, definitely one of the best examples of the genre, especially for the time. So it kind of makes you wonder why it wasn't more popular and why more people haven't played this, more people haven't heard of it. When I interviewed this uh, Ben, and I was thinking back also to my interview with John Hare, you know, these are developers from Europe, and they seem to think, uh, not so much Sven, but definitely uh, John seemed to think that there's kind of a prejudice in America against uh, games made in other countries and you know fears I guess that the translation won't be as good uh, the resources aren't where they need to be I you know I'm not exactly sure why but it definitely seems to be true you know I think of uh, this game in Gothic which I reviewed <laughs> it's got a, that was been a while back we have uh, two different series uh, the Gothic series and this uh, divine divinity series that there's just no good reason why more people haven't played this you know, especially if, if you are a fan of the action RPG. I'm hoping that maybe D Div uh, Divinity Original Sin Kickstarter project will finally put this uh, series on the map in a major way. I'm not saying it's ob obscure, you know, mind you, but definitely hasn't gotten the exposure I think it deserves. And just like I was saying, you fight all this trash and then up comes a badass that <laughs> takes you down <laughs> with just a couple of blows and Ah, uh, there we go. Time to reload. You know, I've got to admit, personally, I've never been a big fan of the of the action RPG. You know, like something with, the, of course, turn-based combat. A little bit more. Sometimes it almost feels, uh, this kind of style almost feels to me like an arcade game. You know, I'm just clicking on mobs. There's not, the battles tend to be so fast, I don't really have a lot of time to think about what I'm doing. So I guess you trade the sort of adrenaline rush uh, for what you might get out of a really successful st 
tactical type of uh, gameplay. But nevertheless, there's a lot of strategy, at least in terms of uh, the skills that you learn, the different spells, different abilities you can combine. I was thinking of maybe later trying to do some combining with some of the rogue abilities. I think they call them the, the survivor. Maybe some traps, combine that with some of these different spells. Uh, you know, like I said before, there's a lot of overlap, so there's a potential here for all kinds of different strategies. Uh, as far as uh, getting this game and running it on a modern system, obviously the best solution, in my opinion, is the to get it from GOG. And I'll provide a link to, to that in the show notes with my affiliate code in it so you can buy this and support the show at the same time. Uh, as of this morning, they're charging $5.99 for it. And that includes a lot of uh, HD wallpapers, the soundtrack, the manual, the uh, little novella that comes with it all in PDF form. And of course, uh, no copy protection to worry about. So uh, quite, a, quite a nice deal. I was able to get it up and running in Windows 7 without any, any issues at all, uh, with the exception of when you run the program, you have to right-click on the icon and say, Run as Administrator. Not exactly sure why. <laughs> you know, I don't pretend to understand the minutia of Windows security issues, but uh, somehow or another, uh, this I guess writes to the disk or the uh, uh, the C drive in a way that the Windows 7 doesn't like. So, if, it, if you have that problem, just click and uh, run it in administration mode, and that should be fine. You don't even have to. One of the things I was really happy to see was the it, it doesn't automatically stretch to widescreen either, which would make it look really stupid. Uh, so this, you get the original uh, perspective, just uh, by default, without e any kind of tampering with the settings at, at all. So just to wrap this up, does it in fact accomplish the, the mission that uh, Sven outlined in that manual? You know, where he said that this was going to be the sort of appealing to the casual mass audience, and but at the same time would have those uh, really in-depth uh, role-playing tactic style uh, features from the... More traditional turn-based games, I don't think they've really reached it at this point in this game. Now, some of the stuff that he has been talking about with that original Sin, uh, that sounds to me a lot closer uh, to the sort of game that might might achieve that that vision. But as far as this game, I think the main thing it has going for it is this this really lovely ambiance they've got going here with the the art the art direction and the music, especially. I'm intrigued uh, by some of the skills and the skill tree and the idea of combining them into different strategies. I also like the idea of uh, all this stuff that's interactive and the adventure game puzzles. So, in short, there's just a lot of stuff here to keep you occupied. Uh, the game, there, there's, of course, uh, some parts of it that people won't like. I don't know if the, the difficulty balance is, is what it should be. <laughs> you, know, you know, maybe I just really suck. Or maybe there are some parts that could have been a little bit uh, smoother. Uh, but all in all, I really enjoyed this game. I'm definitely going to continue playing it. And I'm really, really excited now. Ten times more excited than I was before even about the original Sin Kickstarter. So, anyway, there you have it, folks. Divine Divinity. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with the uh, another part of my interview with Mr. Neil Hawford. Now, this is a developer with a lot of very interesting stories about the games industry that you probably haven't heard before. And he's a really great guy, and I think you'll really enjoy that. So stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you if you have supported this show. Uh, you can do that in a number of ways. Uh, one is, if you want to buy Divine Divinity, just use the link in the show notes here, and that will go to an affiliate code. Uh, you'll get the game at no additional cost to you, uh, but I'll get a small kickback for that, so appreciate it, guys. You know, buy whatever games you want to while you're there. Um, a small part of it will go to support the show, so thanks. Uh, you can also uh, support the show directly uh, by going to armchairarcade.com. Look for the Matt Chat link in the top right corner. Uh, you can make a subscription or a one-time payment, whatever you guys uh, feel the show is worth to you. I appreciate it very, very much. I also have a, a pretty cool announcement here. Uh, my new book, Honoring the Code, has uh, finally been printed and published and has arrived. Uh, this is a this is conversations with great game designers. It features uh, the uh, trans, uh, transcriptions of several of the interviews I've conducted here on Matt Chat, including some stuff that didn't make it into the actual episodes. I've also added uh, introductions to the various personalities here, indexes, and uh, you know tried to clean it up wherever it needed a little bit of uh, extra explanation. Uh, so if you're a fan of the show, I think you'll uh, enjoy this book, or if you uh, 
maybe you want to read something instead of watch YouTube videos all day, uh, this would definitely be something uh, for you. Anyway, I think they've done a really great job with the, the printing of this. Uh, the images turned out great. It uh, isn't too heavy, you know, it feels good. So uh, if you want this book, uh, you can get it from, of course, Amazon, uh, direct from the publisher. Um, I have a few extra copies that the publisher has sent me, and I might be willing to uh, sign those and ship them. Uh, if, you want, if you're interested in that, uh, get in touch with me over email or maybe um, at Armchair Arcade. We'll see if we can uh, work something out with the, uh, the shipping and everything. But anyway, I'm really proud of this, and I hope you'll get a copy and, and tell all your friends about it. Anyway, what about that ale of the week? Now, when I was uh, interviewing us, Vin, I, I was... Uh, really jealous that he's in Belgium uh, and Larian. I, <laughs> I just would love to go there because I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of uh, Belgian L. So uh, I wasn't able to go there but I, uh, to Belgium, but at least I'm able to uh, drink some Belgian ales. And this one is, this one just looks fantastic. Uh, this is, I had no idea how to pronounce it, Straff Hendrick Bruges Triple L 9. Uh, can't read most of the bottle. <laughs> it's brewed in some place called Bruges in Belgium. And, uh, let's see, nine percent alcohol. A genuine Brugen triple from Bruges. Uh, it has a full body taste with rich hints of malt, caramel, and hops. Uh, brewed in Belgium. Let's see what else. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's all they have to say for Belgian ales, right? Brewed in Belgium, and people will buy it. Uh, let's see, amber triples using more roasted malts, which makes them distinct from other triples. Uh, so I just don't see how I can go wrong with this. I love triples and I love Belgian ales and <laughs> this has got it all. Uh, so anyway, let's get this open and uh, see what it's all about. All right, so I got this Straffy Hendrick here in the rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> smells great. <laughs> it's got kind of a, kind of a citrusy, uh, weedy kind of a, you know, really what, what it smells like to me is champagne. Uh, that's probably what it smells like more than anything. Now, let's give it a taste, though. You know, that is uh, definitely a lot milder and subtler than I was expecting from a Belgian triple. It's supposed to have 9% alcohol. Uh, I don't taste that at all. This is a, a very low-key uh, experience for a, for a Belgian ale, especially for a triple. Let me uh, give it another taste here. Yeah, it's just, there's not a lot of flavor here, believe it or not. You sort of taste the, the sort of champagne, grapefruit juice, uh, kind of a grape-like quality to it. A lot of a sort of mild or wheaty flavors. You might, you can imagine a, a blue moon, uh, like a little bit of hint of that sort of wheat, wheaty flavor you get from those. A little bit of a, a citrus quality. Um, overall, though, this is, it's not bad, uh, but it's just really not, not as flavorful. It doesn't have the, the impact that I would expect from a, a Belgian triple, so I'm gonna go a three out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, a little disappointed, you know. I, it's, it's got all the qualities of a, of a Belgian ale, but not just doesn't have that sort of full-bodied uh, character that I really admire from uh, the other ones that I've tried. So, uh, three out of five drinking horns on this. Um, not bad, but you know, <laughs> there's there's better uh, Belgian ales out there. Anyway, uh, let's wrap this up with a quotation, and the quotation I found is from Arthur Schopenhauer, and it goes something like this. The sense of humor is the only divine quality of man. See you guys next week. No, no, look, this shed business, it doesn't really matter at all. The sheds aren't important. It's just a few friends call me two sheds, and that's all there is to it. I wish you'd ask me about my music. I'm a composer. People are always asking about the shed, but they've got it out of proportion. Fed up with the shed. I wish I'd never got it in the first place.